There is an interesting paradox about the relationship between the state and labor unions in Mexico. The Constitution of 1917, which came out of the Mexican Revolution, seemed on paper at least to be favorable to workers. It guaranteed them the right to unionize and strike, protected women and children, limited the workday to eight hours, and promised a living wage. Labor also played an important role in the PRI, the party that ruled the country for more than 70 years. Having working-class support was considered a key to the PRI's stability and strength. However, and this is the paradox, the PRI needed workers to be compliant and on board with their policies. Until democratization, the party kept strict control over unions through a combination of rewards and punishment. Trade union leaders tended to be more loyal to their political benefactors than they were to their own members. In this video, I will discuss the relationship between the Mexican state and labor unions before democratization and the economic effects it had on workers. As I mentioned, the 1917 Constitution was seemingly favorable to workers. And I say seemingly because the promised benefits only went to unions that were pro-government. In the United States, labor disputes get resolved by numerous institutions, from civil courts to arbitration proceedings to administrative forums. In Mexico, however, government labor boards function as courts. The state, therefore, serves as judge, jury, arbitrator, and conciliator in labor disputes. For instance, during President Alamán's term from 1946 to 1952, almost 50% of the petitions to form new unions were rejected by the government. In Mexico, unionization levels aren't representative of worker protection or even of worker militancy. In 1975, 26% of all Mexican workers were unionized. However, much higher percentages could be found in sectors that the government deemed to be key to national development. Here's some examples. 80% of workers were unionized in mining and oil industries, 98% in electricity and gas, and 85% in transportation. And this constituted a large number of workers since state enterprises tended to be much larger than their private counterparts. For instance, the most important public enterprises in the 70s tended to have between 50,000 and 90,000 workers. And compare that to the largest private conglomerate, Alpha, which consisted of 26 firms but only 15,000 workers. Let's look at the historical relationship between the pre- and labor unions. In the 1930s, President Lázaro Cárdenas divided the ruling party into different pillars representing labor, agriculture, military, and the popular sector. As Amy Golden notes, the PRI was more an organization of interest groups rather than a party of individual members. Most of the labor sector at the time was represented by the CTM, or the Confederation of Mexican Workers, which had 600,000 members. Since its inception in 1936, the organization has typically comprised 60 to 70 percent of all unionized workers in the country. For the most part, the PRI was anxious to solidify labor support. And one of the ways in which the government fostered a good relationship with the CTM is by cracking down on independent unions that threatened the CTM's power. The party ensured that the labor board's decisions were favorable to the organization and rewarded union leaders with political positions at all levels of government and guaranteed them at least one seat in the Senate. It was estimated that at the regional level of the party, 38% of the top positions were held by union leaders. Occasionally, when the government feared that labor was getting too powerful relative to the other pillars of the party, they would funnel more resources to other groups or support other labor unions to reduce CTM's influence. One of the important developments in the relationship between the pre- and the labor unions was the phenomenon of charismo. First of all, what does this term mean and how does it apply to unions? Well, the word charro in Mexico means cowboy, and a man by the name of Jesus Diaz de Leon, an early corrupt leader of the railroad union, was nicknamed Charo because of the way that he dressed. The government of President Miguel Alemán, pictured here, deposed the independent leaders of the railroad union and instead imposed Jesus as the new leader. The same thing happened in other key industries, such as petroleum, electricity, and mining. Since then, the term charismo has referred to any case where independent and dem democratically elected leaders are forcefully replaced by government stooges. Its meaning has broadened in recent decades to include any corrupt union leader who is sympathetic to the government. Alamán did more than install friendly union leaders, though. He also took a hard line against strikers, allowing the government to level criminal charges against them. For example, when there was a strike at the Nuevo Rosita coal mine in 1950, the government declared martial law, arrested the leaders of the strike, took control of the union's treasury, and prohibited them from calling any future meetings. They even made sure that local employers didn't sell food to the strikers. The results were telling. The number of strikes fell from 245 in the previous presidential term to 26 in Alamán's term. In 
Let's look in more detail about what benefits the Chattero system offered workers and union leaders. That is, what was the government offering, that is, what was the carrot, to get workers and leaders to be compliant? First, there were material rewards. Union leaders, especially those of important industries like oil, were allowed to accumulate massive amounts of wealth. In the case of Jesus Diaz de Leon, the government ensured that all union dues were funneled directly to him instead of the union treasury. In the oil sector, an agreement in 1947 allowed union leaders to set up subcontracting companies to supply their services to the state oil company, Pemex. Workers in general also received benefits such as subsidized access to health care, housing, and basic goods, as well as scholarships and loans. The government made sure that these rewards were allocated selectively so they could be used as an incentive for workers to be compliant. There were also political benefits. Union leaders could expect to be appointed to the Board of Directors of Public Enterprises, which reserved some seats for workers, or to the Executive Committee of the CTM, or a position in the party. As I noted before, the government did more than just provide benefits to compliant workers. They also made sure that rebellious workers and union leaders were treated harshly. Union leaders and striking workers have been fired and sometimes jailed. The government is free to prohibit strikes and has resorted to violence if workers fail to comply with the order. Many jobs in public enterprises are done by temporary workers. For instance, between 1977 and 82, 52% of the workers in the oil industry consisted of temporary labor. Hiring temporary workers was a way in which union leaders could gauge worker loyalty. These laborers were supposed to demonstrate their loyalty by providing free labor on union farms, enthusiastically marching in political demonstrations, and in the case of women, sometimes providing sexual services. What were some of the results of this system? Well, first, it was of obvious benefit to the Mexican state. Union leaders suppressed worker discontent, ensured that workers voted, gave money to the PRI, participated in marches and demonstrations, and Chato leaders in general became invested in the system and were strong supporters of the PRI. It was certainly lucrative for union leaders as well, it was estimated in the mid-1980s that they earned a total of $750 million every year by leveraging their positions to, quote, extract bribes and payoffs from management, contractors, and public officials. As for the effect on worker standard of living, the answer is less clear. Research has found that the real wage was either stagnant or declining from the late 30s to early 50s. And some have shown that the real wages may have fallen by 50% during Mexico's early foray into import substitution industrialization. Real wages did increase significantly, however, until the 1970s. The system worked best both for the government and unionized workers when there were a lot of resources to be distributed. When economic conditions worsened in the 70s and 80s, the system came under strain. Here's one striking example from that period. The Teachers Union in Mexico, with the acronym SNTE, went on strike in the late 80s in protest against their own leaders. Real salaries had fallen by more than 50% in the preceding seven years, and teachers were afraid to complain because of union violence. In the previous decade, more than 150 teachers who had rebelled against the system had been murdered, primarily in the South. Primary school teachers earned about $150 a month, but were forced to pay $600 to get their job. And 1% of their salaries were automatically deducted and assigned to the union, which profited handsomely from its political alliances with the PRI. The year of the strike, union leaders received 16 seats in the lower house of Congress, 42 seats in state legislatures, and more than 100 mayorships. Overall, unions lost a lot of influence and credibility in the 1980s because of cases exactly like this. Unemployment reached 17.6%, and real minimum wage rates went down by more than 40%. As Kevin Middlebrook noted, the reaction of union leaders was one of quote-unquote silence. In another video, I'll discuss the ways in which democratization and economic reform have transformed the relationship between labor unions and the state in Mexico. But if you want to learn more about the PRI and unions, take a look at Amy Golden's piece, Collective Bargaining in Mexico, Stifled by the Lack of Democracy and Trade Unions, or Judith Teichman's book, Privatization and Political Change in Mexico. It has a chapter dedicated to unions and public enterprises and their relationship with the PRI. Other good sources include Jeffrey Bortz and Marcos Aguila's Earning a Living, A History of Real Wage Studies in 20th Century Mexico, and Kevin Middlebrook's The Sound of Silence, Organized Labor's Response to Economic Crisis in Mexico.